It looks like PlayStation didn't want to give Jeff Keighley that Summer Game Fest money, so they started it off this week. Let's talk. What up, viewers? What up? What up? Calc Soups here, and today is Friday, May 31st, and that means it's time for a quick recap of the week in video game news. Like I said, uh, somewhat stopping, starting off Summer Game Fest this week was PlayStation's State of Play. This is the first State of Play, I think, this year? Is there a State of Play? I don't think there was a State of Play earlier this year, so it's been a while. Sony has been kind of quiet, um, and there were a handful of interesting titles that I want to talk about right now. Um, the biggest of which is I'd love to see a full scale Astrobot game rather than, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed Astrobot on the PlayStation five when I got it, uh, you know, good two, three hour kind of nostalgia trip experience, uh, and love to see that kind of flushed out into a longer game and, and all the different skins you get to put on Astrobot. So, uh, yeah, very much any PlayStation owners who haven't sat down and put two hours into Astrobot, uh, you, and if you have, any nostalgia for the older consoles, uh, you will thoroughly enjoy it. And uh, yeah, that was the that was my big, uh, big title coming out of some or uh, PlayStation City Play. Uh, the other two that kind of uh, looked cool to me was uh, we got a little bit more information on the Silent Hill Two remake, uh, which I know a lot of people are very excited about. Um, and the one the other remake that I'm curious or I I put on my list, but I'm I'm kind of reflecting on uh, whether or not it is as exciting as I. Put it here but i without further ado i'm talking about until dawn until dawn's getting a full-fledged makeover uh remake and i'm actually kind of surprised by that until dawn is i think it was in 2015 or so so it isn't that old i mean at this point it, that was a decade ago um but the game like the graphics were like so photorealistic i'm i'm pretty sure they they still hold up today so yeah, I'm, I I put it on the list because I was excited to see more Until Dawn information, but just had a second to reflect, like, is it, like, does it need to be remade? I don't know. Um, I bet it still works, although backwards compatibility and all that kind of stuff out the window with Sony. Anyway, um, yeah, let me know what you think of Until Dawn getting remade down below. Uh, they also had a few other games. Uh, none of the new games really, besides Astrobot, kind of really sparked my attention. Uh, the God of War uh pc you know good to see that god of war is reaching other or god of war ragnarok is going on other con on other platforms um the the marvel rival game didn't really catch my eye concord was no i apparently this is the second time we've seen concord i don't even remember the first time uh, and i didn't make an impression today so uh but there was a bunch of other games if you felt i forgot anything leave it down below in the comments or something i should keep my eyes on Moving right along, uh, as discussed last week, Multiverses launched this week, uh, and they're already putting up pretty big numbers. Uh, according to an article I read, there was 110k concurrent users on Steam, uh, which is actually pretty surprising considering the the um, the fighting genre isn't really big on uh, on Steam, or at least what we know of the traditional like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat fighting genre. Steam and PC are not usually a pretty big proponent of, uh, or pretty big section of the uh, market for them. So the fact that they're putting up really big numbers, I think they were number three on the charts for uh, on launch day, um, and those are really big concurrent user numbers. So uh, yeah, Multiverses is is going off without a hitch. Uh, read a few things about uh, whether or not people like the changes that have been made since it went since it uh, came back, but uh, yeah, overall excited to see Multiverses. Uh, launching for the second time uh, and doing some pretty good numbers. Speaking of the second time, Destiny 2 um, launched its or had its launch trailer because Destiny 2 The Final Shape uh, DLC comes out next week. Uh, we get to see the launch trailer for that. Um, it definitely looked pretty final. I am I mean, I know that they're probably not going to do Destiny 3. Like, I've just kind of accepted that back into my heart. Um, but this one feels, I mean, that's probably the true of every Destiny trailer, but this one feels kind of like, this is the final one, and it even says the final shape. So I'm very curious uh, if maybe Destiny 3 is somewhere on the horizon and, and we'll get more information sometime soon. But uh, wish them all the best of luck on the Destiny 2 launch, uh, but I'm still waiting for a third one before I hop in. And we got the official Black Ops 6 announcement this week. I can't believe there's already been six Black Ops games five previous Black Ops games. Uh, and they also had the gall to call 
this like CG a not I don't want to I don't want to throw AI in there. This kind of CG um, trailer live action because it kind of pretends to be real life politicians, which is another angle that I thought was pretty weird. Um, and the fact that Black Ops games are supposed to be like historical, so I guess the '90s is is historical because it has. Uh, Bill Clinton and George H.W. and Margaret Thatcher and Saddam Hussein. Um, you know, all of that being like we're going to be in a 90s, you know, semi-futuristic tech 90s. I'm, I'm very curious what they're going to do with with it because the Black Ops games are always like historical, but with, you know, the sci-fi, you know, souped up tech technology uh, added in. So Anyway, I digress, but uh, yeah, Black Ops 6 got its announcement, and so uh, no no release date, but we can all kind of expect that first weekend in November, or the last weekend in October being launch date for that. So I don't really need to put a date on it, because we know when, when it comes out, because it comes out at the same time every year. Moving right along, we got a nail in the coffin for game ownership, uh, pun intended, you'll see so in a second. Um, according to an Ars Technica article, um, someone posted a response from Steam to, where the user was asking whether or not they could will their Steam account to members of the family. And according to Steam, uh, all games are non-transferable. Uh, the one way that... It, so if you were to die, you would not be able to will away your Steam account to friends or family or anything like that. Um so, you know, again, that kind of bolsters this whole the whole argument against game ownership. I know a lot of people are there or a vocal minority have been talking, you know, you don't digitally own the game. And, and while digital is the main way that which people consume games nowadays, I, uh, you know, I think there's still an argument to be made about kind of ownership and talking about that. The way that they talked about in the article and was my first thought that you could get around that is just giving your family the you know, username and password to your Steam account. And while they wouldn't be able to, uh, they would be able to change any information they want about it, put their own credit cards in and all that kind of stuff, uh, and make it in a new person's account. I guess if you happen to have two different accounts, you can't merge them, which is something that they talked about in the article. But uh, if you have, you know, a large number of, of uh, Steam games on your Steam account, you can always just give your password away before you kick the bucket. So, uh, uh, but... You can't will it to them in a uh, in a in your will. So keep keep track of that uh, if you're thinking of giving away your Steam library to a family member. Moving right along, uh, one of the biggest, probably most uh, the most positive uh, people in the gaming community right now is Sven Vinicky Vin Minky, the CEO of Larian. Um, and he had a pretty interesting article this week. Um, he talked about crunch, something that, uh, you know, is, is very much a third rail in the games industry. Um, and he said that there was a little crunch on Baldur's Gate 3 and that he thinks it's, you know, somewhat inevitable. Um, now, I, for one, agree with him. I think that um, I think that a little bit of a, an emphasis on a little bit. I think a little bit of crunch towards getting, you know, making sure you're hitting goals and getting a project through the uh, over the goal line, I think is is definitely um, reasonable. And I think that, you know, again, over time should always be voluntary. And if someone can't make it, it shouldn't be held accountable. It, it shouldn't be held against them. Um, but in order to get a product over a finish line, I think that some people are going to have to work outside the normal 40 hours a week uh, limitation now. Uh, I am no, I am by no means saying that people should be working 110, 120 hours a week like uh, some of the horrible crunch stuff that we heard about back when uh, the articles were flowing out of like Activision and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, I don't think it is reasonable that you can get something as large and complicated as a quarter or a half a billion dollar game across the goal line without someone somewhere working over 40 hours. Uh, I just think that's unreasonable. And so, you know, take, take it all with a grain of salt when you hear crunch and it's not, there's, there's scales to this and there's a little bit of shades of gray in there. And, and, uh, <clears throat> so I just thought it was interesting that someone who's highly regarded right now in the games industry, um, is saying something that possibly is a little bit, uh, controversial. So <clears throat> something I wanted to point it out, uh, and something I agree with. <clears throat> 
um, for a little bit of a history lesson. Um, I want to talk about the price of games because there was an article that came out this week. Uh, so back in the early 2000s, uh, games were $50. Uh, for people who were buying games around there, they were about 50, there were $50 for your, for your AAA game. Um, and then Call of Duty hit the market in 2004, um, and they pushed it up to $60. Now, all of a sudden, a $50 game was 20% more, and, and it would cost $60. And, and that uh, <coughs> that is where uh, the price of AAA gaming stayed for basically two console generations, like 15 years. Uh, it's from like 04 to, to 2020, so 16 years. Um, and then what happened in 2020, the launch of the next gen consoles came out. So, uh, the PlayStation five and the Xbox series X, uh, uh X came out. Uh, and at that point, uh, it, it became a, will they, won't they kind of moment. And yeah, they pushed the price point up to $70 for kind of your top of the line AAA games. And I know that a couple of publishers, some of the, a lot of the major publishers are kind of wishy-washy on what's actually $60 and what's actually $70, but you know, your NBAs and your Call of Duties and, and your FIFAs are all that have been pushed up to $70 since 2020. <clears throat> so I got around, I, all of that was just a little bit of a history lesson. And hearing from someone we probably don't care to hear from much, very much, but uh, the CEO of Embracer started talking about game pricings and, and actually uh, I went into it thinking that he was going to be like, oh, it's going to be 80 sometime soon. Um, but he actually was saying something reasonable like, uh, questioning whether or not it should go up. Uh, you know, there are there are ways for consumers to spend more, maybe with a season pass um, or early access or all the other stuff that they're adding in for, for or a battle pass. There are a way to monetize those people who will spend more to buy a game. Um, and that is something that has kind of been proven out and been able to do. So the average price of a game, as far as on the publisher side of thing, is above $70 usually nowadays. Um, so definitely something to keep track of. Um, and I think, you know, so I went into it thinking the Embracer was, the CEO of Embracer was going to say something dumb, but I actually agreed. And he was saying, you know, I question whether or not uh, we'll see a $80 or, or higher price point for a base AAA game anytime soon. And I think that is definitely reasonable. I think there are a lot more indie games coming out at 40 to $50 nowadays that are, that you know, provide a longer experience than like a Call of Duty campaign does nowadays. Um, and so, um, yeah, it begs the question of like, are people, you know, if the price points keeps getting higher, are people just going to buy more smaller games for the same amount of money? So uh, definitely something to consider. I know that, that there are people who, you know, exclusively play the sports games. And so they'll continue to buy FIFA every year, uh, even though it's at, you know, depending on whatever price it they're at, you know, but, uh, you know, I think anybody who's playing more than one or two genres each year is going to um, <clears throat> um, is going to potentially, you know, opt for something smaller uh, and and hopefully bring on the indie revolution that we all desperately craze. But uh, yeah, that just thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, the one thing they did bring up was, you know, for these RPGs that you spend 100, 200, 300 hours in should those cost more than you know your typical triple a game uh and i kind of agree with that like should you know the witcher or fallout 4 games i put hundreds of hours into should i should i have paid more for those um probably uh i you know i do feel bad for the people who put two three hours into the witcher and then put it down and they paid a hundred dollars for it but uh for someone who got someone like me who got hundreds of hours of, of entertainment from uh from this game you know i kind of agree that maybe i should have played more at the time but uh but i digress so let me know what you think about game pricing and and uh the different types of models and that you could uh, get for it so anyway moving right along um we have finally gotten what we've all desperately wanted uh lego has finally brought the world of hyrule to life with little plastic bricks. Um, so yeah, there was an official uh, Legend of Zelda uh, Lego set that came out, uh, or that what became available for pre-order uh, this week. I'll have a link down below for you to check it out. Um, it's two in one, and it's the Great Deku Tree. So you can either dress up the Great Deku Tree like it is in the 
uh, kind of the Breath of the Wild timeline uh, with all the pink kind of cherry blossom flowers, or you can set it up or you can build it to look like kind of your ocarina of time, darker, uh, but with different, you know, with your plants as, as opposed to a, a, a Korok, uh, like a little Korok in it and all this kind of stuff. You can kind of design it either one of two different ways. Um, the price point was a little bit, <coughs> there was a little bit of sticker shock with the price point as a $300 uh, product with like 2,500 bricks or whatever. Um, I thought the whole sell of like two in one was not, I didn't like it because uh, you're only going to be able to display one Deku tree. Uh, and now you do get two different choices on which, on how it's going to sit on your shelf. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, you only get one Deku tree to put on that shelf. So the fact that they were kind of selling it like it was two separate kits um, I think was a little disingenuous. Um, I might still buy a $300 uh, Lego kit. Don't let my wife know. She'll kill me if I just buy another, you know, 12 inch tall hunk of plastic that just sits on the shelf. Um, but uh, very much, very excited for, I've been sp sprinkling Legend of Zelda Lego uh, breadcrumbs throughout the news report for uh, over a year now. So I am very excited to see uh, kind of the world of Hyrule and Legend of Zelda come to Lego sets uh, and be officially uh, be officially out there in that they've done those really bad Mario ones. And I was like, oh, I would, I'd rather have Zelda. So uh, I kind of just want the minifigs. I just want Zelda and Link uh, minifigs. So however I can get that, uh, I'll pay. I'll probably have to pay 100 bucks for that. But uh, yeah, that's all I, all I kind of really want. Uh, there may be other stuff that I want, but uh, but for now... Just want the Zelda minifigs. But if you think that a two-in-one Zelda Lego kit sounds cool, I'll link down below so you can check that out. Moving on to actual games that launched semi-recently. Uh, there was a cool parkour game. Now we are several, almost a decade and a half removed from the kind of parkour craze as it was hitting gaming uh, with games like Mirror's Edge and even Brink for those people who are a little bit deeper than Mirror's Edge into getting into parkour games. But um, there's a new one that came out this week or, or uh, like 10 days ago uh, called Rooftops and Alleys. And uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot about it to love. There's uh, it really shows kind of the movement and flow and it's got a lot of uh, different ways that you can interact with it. So uh, I checked it out this week and I thought it looked pretty cool. So uh, I thought we could uh, talk about it this week. So. Uh, feel free to check out Rooftops and Alleys launching, uh, launched into early access uh, just a week and a half ago. Last but not least, uh, there was a lot of talk about the final thing happening this week, uh, and I hate the uh, now is the best time kind of call to actions, but uh, I get, there was an article for Wildermyth. Uh, Wildermyth is a procedurally generated narrative game uh, that came out like two years ago, I think, at this point. Um, they're having their final DLC launching this uh, sometime soon. Um, and uh, they made an announcement. They're like, yes, the next expansion that we make will be the final DLC. Um, and then we are going into hibernation. So uh, they talked about how the company is uh, independently owned. So they're not like being shut down or shuttering or anything like that. But uh, after they put out this expansion, um, they will, you know, I guess be working on the next project, which is excited to see because I think Wildermyth was a slam dunk and I... I really liked it, so uh, I haven't played any of the DLCs, so now might be a really good time for me and others to either pick up the one that they already have, go buy some DLCs, and uh, and get into the final one before uh, before they're done developing it. So uh, if you haven't checked out Wildermyth, yeah, I, I, I really love the game, So uh, and it's got a really cool art style, and it's turn-based strategy, which I love as well. Um, and it's got the whole legacy system in the game is uh, really impressive and something that I enjoy, so... Uh, I'll have a link down below. You can check that out. So uh, that's it for this week. Let me know down below if you feel I forgot anything. But as always, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy this content. Any type of engagement is good engagement. And as always, I hope you have a super day. I hope you have a super weekend. And I hope you have a super day. Bye.